Okay, today I'm very happy to uh, bring back uh, my friends and colleague uh, Bob Carlin and Sig Hacker uh, to discuss, uh, you know, very important, but also, you know, very, very tough question uh, in, in dealing with uh, North Korea. Uh, as you know, uh, Bob and Sig uh, wrote uh, a very important uh, you know, article about, like, uh, about two months ago. Uh, entitled is, is Kim Jong Un uh, preparing uh, for war. So this got a lot of attention, uh, not only in this country but also in Korea, Japan, China, uh, and elsewhere. So I couldn't resist uh, inviting them back to uh, our campus uh, to discuss, and I got a lot of tough questions for you guys. <laughs> But, uh, uh, you know, as you know, uh, Bob and Sik, uh, they are very well-known experts uh, on North Korea. So let me uh, briefly uh, introduce, uh, you know, both of them. So Bob Carlin has a very distinguished uh, career uh, in the U.S. government. And uh, he visited North Korea over 30 times. It's a lot. And then, you know, Bob is considered the best expert uh, on North Korea. And then, actually, uh, he uh, worked uh, at the CSEC downstairs uh, for some years. And actually, both Bob and, you know, uh, you know Sik, uh, we've been uh, working together on North Korean issue uh, for a long time. Now, uh, he's uh, a non-resident scholar at the Middlebury Institute for International Studies uh, in Monterey. And uh, Sig Hacker, Dr. Sig Hacker, uh, I'm sure many of you know him as well. So he was uh, at the Los Alamos uh, National Lab uh, for 30, uh, 34 years, uh, including 12 years as director uh, from 86 to uh, 97. And he moved to Stanford. And so you're here for like more than 10 years, right? Or so. Five, yeah. Yeah. And also uh, at CSEC. And you know, he went to actually see uh, nuclear facilities uh, in North Korea. So I think he's one of, I, I don't know, maybe he's the only one, only non, uh, I don't know, maybe non-North Korean or Western experts to visit the sites of uh, uh, nuclear facilities uh, in, in North Korea. And lately he wrote a book on the Hinge Point, on inside look at North Korea's uh, nuclear program. So. You know, Bob has a uh, long experience in policy and, you know, certainly SIG is expert in nuclear bombs and other technological issues. So you can have uh, any better combination of uh, you know, people uh, talking about uh, this issue. So uh, I think uh, the study is North Korea preparing, you know, for war. And, uh, you know, each of them will be speaking for about 10 to 15 minutes. And then I lead a conversation for maybe you know, 15 to 20 minutes, and they will open up uh, for Q&A. So uh, let's welcome uh, both Bob and Sik. Uh, thank you, Kubak. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Really great to be back here uh, on the Stanford campus, and especially uh, here in Encino Hall, where I used to have my office uh, right downstairs from here. And I spent 17 uh, really exciting. Seven, it was 17 years uh, at Stanford. But then I decided it was time to, to retire. So I hooked up instead with Monterey and with Texas A&M University because I figured I hadn't solved all the world's nuclear problems. <laughs> In fact, they seemed to get worse. So when Bob and I uh, wrote this article, <clears throat> actually that was published uh, January 11th, uh, we titled it as Kim Jong-un Preparing for War. And we figured it would raise a little bit of controversy as such, <clears throat> uh, but the reaction has been unbelievable. Uh, and it's still, people are still writing articles today about our article. Uh, and so <clears throat> what we thought we would do uh, is try to explain uh, our uh, situation. And so first of all, if we start with the question, is Kim Jong-un preparing for war? Uh, was North Korea preparing for war? Of course, you know, the Korean War was never settled. Uh, it was an armistice, and so more or less, you know, Korea has been preparing for war. But what we try to get across, this is different, uh, and we are really uh, concerned. Uh, and what we state in the article, the, the point that we said, 
we believe Kim Jong-un has made a strategic decision to go to war. Uh, that's pretty serious. And that, of course, you know, caused a, a lot of concern. Uh, and what we're going to try to do, and I'll try to do it very short to introduce Bob, is try to explain our thinking as to what led us uh, uh, to that. Uh, and that thinking is really based, and I would say um, I covered that with uh, a lot of help from uh, my colleague, Elliot Servan, who was uh, my research assistant here. Uh, and then, of course, a, a lot of advice from Bob Carlin in this book called Hinge Points. Uh, and I'll have this outside from Stanford University Press that was published uh, just about uh, a year ago. Uh, and, and what I try to describe in great detail in, in that book uh, is that come around 1990 time frame, uh, so just as the Cold War, uh, War was drawing down, Kim Il-sung, a leader then uh, of North Korea, made this strategic decision to say that he's going to seek normalization uh, with the United States. Uh, and because uh, of his concern and sort of the overhanging shadow uh, of China and also his concern about Russia. Uh, and then what I demonstrate in the book is for 30 years, three Kims exactly followed that policy as they were interested in normalization with the United States. Now, North Korea has a funny way of doing things, and so most people in the United States don't believe that. Uh, you know, and there's lots of talk about provocations and all the things that North Koreans did. Uh, and what we believe is really when the chips were down, as you looked all the way through, that all three Kims, in the end, wanted to seek normalization. However, uh, because of the way, you know, Korea is, it is a small country, they were not taking any chances. So they followed a dual track policy. One was do dialogue for normalization, but the second developed the nuclear weapons option and the nuclear weapons capability. And so then what I show in the book is that just time after time, you could see the North Koreans are following both of those, not one or the other, but both. And which one was sort of higher priority, depending on lots of things, you know, domestic, international, and everything else. But so they were developing both of those. And since they were developing the nuclear weapon option all along, there were, of course, then many times when the Americans said, you know, like, how could you do this? You know, that happened first uh, during, uh, in a big way, during the Bush administration. After it came in, Clinton administration had signed this agreed framework. Uh, and the Bush administration, particularly at that time, uh, uh, John Bolton, uh, he said, hey, we have found out through the intelligence community that North Koreans were cheating. Even though they froze their plutonium program, uh, they were clandestinely pursuing uranium enrichment. Well, it, it turns out Bob Carlin was, was there at the time in the 1990s, etc. And the Clinton administration, they knew that the North Koreans weren't clandestinely pursuing that However, the benefits of having them freeze the plutonium, the direct way to the path, uh, sort of outweighed that. But that's not what the Bush administration decided. So we had a hinge point. That's what I call it. So it was the decision point. Uh, and, and the U.S. government then made the decision, President Bush made the decision, they're going to walk away from this agreed framework because the North Koreans are cheating. And, and so what I demonstrate in the book uh, in the spirit uh, of what uh, Professor Elizabeth Pate really knows well and what I learned in management science and engineering, you do risk analysis. Uh, and if it involves nuclear weapons, you do technically informed risk analysis. And this was a bad decision. It was not technically informed. It was not weighing the risk. You should have stayed with it, uh, you know, and take it farther and see just how far you can get because the danger is were not that great of staying with it. The dangers were enormous if you walked away because we walked away, the North Koreans built the bomb. A few years later, they tested the bomb. And then I, I demonstrate, you know, similar things happened in Obama administration. Uh, by that time, Kim Jong-il uh, first and then Kim Jong-un would launch a satellite. And Obama administration, that was a missile. That was against what we had agreed, another hinge point. Again, they made the wrong decision. Uh, and then the really big hinge point then happened. By this time, they had nuclear weapons. They developed them because 
of these decisions and their policy uh, of going uh, dual track, uh, that came during the Trump uh, administration. And so Trump first actually did the right things in a Singapore summit. Uh, and then by the time they got to Hanoi, which we reminded ourselves is now five years ago, uh, so a long time ago, again, they made the wrong decision. They walked away from a potential deal because they thought the North Koreans wanted too much. Uh, and that's actually one of the few times Trump got accolades from both sides of the aisle, saying he was right to walk away. I published a paper right afterwards. I said, no, he was wrong to walk away. Uh, and indeed, it then led up uh, to a big change uh, in North Korea. Uh, and that big change, uh, uh, Bob is going to explore, uh, explore and explain to you, because we followed essentially of how Kim Jong-un then reacted to what happened in Hanoi. We followed that over the next two years. And then when the North Koreans made a decision to actually abandon this 30-year policy of seeking normalization with the United States. So what we say uh, in the book is we think this is a more dangerous time th than any time since uh, the start of the Korean War. And so one of the reasons, as Bob will explain, they've made this change in policy that was in place for more or less these 30 years. And then the second one that's particularly near and dear to my heart, uh, and that's the one that I've studied, is now they have nukes. You know, they've done six nuclear tests. We don't know exactly how many nukes they have. To some extent, it doesn't matter. It's 50, 60 or something like that. And you have those nukes in the hands of the small hand. North Korea is only one of three countries in the world that can threaten the U.S. and its assets with nuclear weapons, the other two being China and uh, Russia. And so that's why we say it's that dangerous and Bob is going to explain the rest of the story to you. Thank you. Okay. You know, this being March 2024, is that right? I think so. I think so. Um, this marks 50 years that I've been working on North Korea. If, if you want to express your sympathies to me later, that's fine. <laughs> it's been a long road. Interesting, but long. Uh, at, at the beginning, I want to pull on a couple of threads uh, that we've seen in response to our article. Sig mentioned there's been this enormous um, industry we created of people writing about it, pushing back on it. The first thing is we've heard many, many times, uh, well, the North Koreans would never attack across the demilitarized zone because they know they would be wiped out. And anyway, there are no signs of attack preparations now. So you guys must be wrong. Well, um, the reason we said this is the most dangerous time, and as Sig pointed out, it's probably um, the first time since June 1950 that a North Korean leader has made a decision, a strategic decision to go to war. There have been a few times when tensions have gone up significantly. In my view, they were not ready to go to war in any of those um, instances. This time is different. That's why this is so dangerous. Uh, and I'll describe in a second. Um, in fact, why don't I do it right now? Sig described the policy from 1990 all the way through 2019, fundamentally uh, around um, two goals. One was to engage the United States as a buffer against China and Russia, who certainly in 1990 looked very dangerous to Kim Il-sung. But there's also a second reason that they adopted this policy, which is they wanted to create a propitious external security environment so that they could focus more on the economy. Both of those were in play throughout this period. And we saw, as a matter of fact, we saw uh, periods when the North Korean leader was actually pursuing some sorts of reform policies, not up to our standards, perhaps, nevertheless important economic reforms. 
those two um, centerpieces to the policy in effect created a break on North Korean actions. That is, they would play on the edge of the cliff frequently, sometimes to get our attention, maybe sometimes for internal reasons, but they never intended to go over because they wanted to normalize with the Americans. That was the whole point of this policy. If they've abandoned that now, and that is what Kim uh, Sig and I think has happened, and we've got evidence for it. If they've abandoned that, there's no, there's no more break on the policy, or at least we don't know where it is. We don't know the next time they're dancing on the edge of the cliff if they will necessarily pull back. Um, and that's obviously very dangerous. It's scary, but it's also very dangerous. It isn't something recent that sparked our concern. Uh, we didn't pull this conclusion out of a hat. We based it, as Sig mentioned, we based it on a very careful study of, Nor and in some cases day by day, of North Korean policy since 1990 up through 2019. And it was very clear that they had a, a core um, policy goal uh, and every time it looked like they were they were going off in a, the wrong direction from our Santa point of view, they came back uh, over and over again. They made proposals in order to normalize with the Americans. Beginning in August 2021, when the United States withdrew from Afghanistan, there seemed to be very strong evidence that this was a watershed event as far as the North Koreans were concerned. This meant the end of the unipolar world. It meant the end of U.S. dominance. It meant that there were opportunities for the North Koreans that had not existed before. Not only opportunities, but in their mind, um, uh, responsibilities to push against the United States. In the autumn of 2021, we saw them sort of tiptoeing towards the Russians. Very subtle signs, but they seemed to us that they were um, heading in that direction. And by January 2022, uh, the jig was up. Uh, they made a Politburo, uh, had a Politburo meeting. They announced new measures that demonstrated that the uh, old policy with the U.S. was over and that they were going to um, align, not quite align themselves, but move much more towards the Russians. This is before Ukraine happened. Um, people who suggest that that is what motivated the North Koreans are missing the fact that the fundamental North Korean decisions were made earlier than that. At the end of 2022, there was a party plenum at which Kim started using the phrase war preparations. Some people say, oh, that's normal North Korean rhetoric. It's not normal. They had not been talking about at that level publicly to their own people about war preparations. They talked a lot about deterrence, which meant building up but not war preparations. Through 2023, we saw that war preparations theme over, you, by Kim Jong-un, and this is what's important to about it, because it's the highest level of authority. Over and over again, he stresses this theme. Uh, in March last year, there was a very high-level article in the party daily, something we call a commentator article. Why is that important? Because commentator articles are very rare and tend to reflect decision points in the leadership. So when you see one of these articles, it means a decision uh, has been made. And this decision had to do to, uh, um, with policy towards South Korea. Kim announced it. He, uh, 
he filled in the picture in December at a, another party. I think it was a party plenum. But in fact, and so everybody focuses on that as if this was the big change in North Korean policy. The decisions were made a year ago in March, and they very carefully and very North Korean style uh, revealed it piece by piece. Again, we're talking about decisions that have been made at the highest levels of the party. Uh, by the by the beginning of 2024, it seemed to us that um, this policy was fixed uh, and it was beginning to fill out. We've This year so far, we've seen nothing to suggest that Kim has wavered from that decision. There's more references to war preparations, uh, more visits by Kim to armaments plants, and not just the type of armaments that are going to Russia. Um, these are these are big, heavy war fight, strategic war fighting um, equipment. Uh, most important, they have primed the pan for a clash in the Yellow Sea in the West Sea. Kim has made it clear that he's going to redefine the country's boundaries. Part of that is going to be in the West Sea, which is a very um, dangerous, probably the most dangerous a place in, on the peninsula, uh, most likely to have a clash that escalates. And he's deliberately poking his finger in that, uh, probably by later this year, which suggests that something is going to blow up at that point. I've, I've heard people say, well, he doesn't really want to go to war. He just wants to seize an island. Seizing an island in the West Sea is an act of war. And he knows that. And I think he's deliberately provoking something like that. We'll have to see. We need to follow this step by step. Um, but everything that we've seen for the last uh, year, for sure, suggests to me uh, very strongly that this is a decision the regime has made and that it's patiently going to move in this direction. One point to note, a strategic decision to go to war is not the same thing as a war plan. I don't even know if he has a war plan yet. Um, a strategic decision, there's a, there's a, there can be a gap of years between that sort of a decision and D-Day. There can be, there got to be preparations, they've got to have deception operations, they've got to prepare their population. So what I think what we're watching and we're going to be watching for the next, I'll stick my neck out, year, um, are these very patient preparations along with efforts to distract us. So um, there's going to be a lot of debate back and forth about what he's doing. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, we've got to keep our eye focused on the possibility that he's about to do something extremely dangerous and will cause a uh, conflag conflagration, excuse me, um, in Northeast Asia. So when uh, uh, this got published uh, in 38 North, um, I mean, a lot of uh, attention in the Korean media, uh, as you know, and then uh, I got uh, many kind of calls and inquiry uh, from friends in Korea uh, asking, I think you know, one common question was, what was uh, your motivation or objective uh, writing this piece? Because, um, I mean, to be fair, it's quite controversial, right? I mean, I trust uh, your expertise, your judgment, but still overall conclusion is not without controversy. Uh, probably you knew that. So what was your intention? I mean, uh, trying to, you know, urge Washington to pay more attention to North Korean issue or give a warning to U.S. and other stakeholders. I mean, what's your main uh, motivation or intent of writing this piece? So from, from my standpoint, and of course, since you mentioned South Korea and the United States, uh, and, and my view, and having been down in South Korea a few times, uh, I, I see their political system too close to the United States political system. And so I would say both South Korea uh, and the United States 
somebody's always looking for a political angle mm. you know, in terms of motivation. Like, what was our political motivation? I don't have any political motivation. Uh, and so the concern was, uh, uh, from my standpoint, certainly, since Bob and I have been doing this for a long time now, and we can't seem particularly to get the American government to pay attention to North Korea. If you just look at it, it's just not there. And, and of course, since the Biden administration, you can have lots of excuses, uh, you know, from Ukraine uh, to Israel, Hamas, and so forth. And these are all things that, of course, they're burning up now. But having followed the North Korea situation for so many years, we think this very dangerous place, and they've got nukes. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that combination, uh, in my opinion, it, it was time to say, look, we got to pay attention. So my motivation would have been mostly to get it to the attention of the American public uh, and the American government. And of course, also in South Korea, of course, I don't understand the politics uh, mm -hmm. as well in South Korea. Uh, but I thought that that was important. Uh, to put it out there. And so we put it out there in perhaps in somewhat more raw terms than usual. Uh, and um, that did get a lot of people's uh, attention. But Bob, yours. I, I agree that our major concern, my major concern was Washington needed to wake up. Yeah. I've been watching uh, the talking points uh, day after day from the White House and from the State Department. And I finally created a file in my computer labeled Dribble. And I put this stuff in there because mm. these talking points did not seem to reflect any sort of thinking about um, the enormity of the problem, especially as it has developed recently. And so we needed to do some something. I The image I have is Cassandra riding along with Paul Revere, trying to get people to pay attention to this dangerous problem. Mm. Okay, now, uh, so you mentioned about, you know, war preparation uh, by North Korea. It might take a uh, year or two years. So when you say war, I mean, what do you mean? I mean, because uh, in, in the past, you know, sinking submarine or shelling islands, I mean, there are some military conflict. But uh, when you say, you know, war, I mean, do you mean uh, including a full-scale war uh, involving nukes? Or it's more like, uh, I mean, because, uh, you know, there has been some military conflict between two sides. So what do you mean by war? Do you want to try that one? We may have somewhat different opinions. Well, my view has been, my view has been that war can, in fact, be defined or used differently. There's limited war, there's conventional war, there's guerrilla war, there's nuclear war. Um, so I don't know which of those Kim has chosen. I do uh, think that he will be asking his general staff for plans that, uh, that allow him to achieve his objectives. Don't ask me what those are, I don't know. But to achieve his object objectives with the least possible uh, hurt to himself. Mm -hmm. If he thinks that a massive attack on the United States bases in Korea and Japan will work, maybe he'll do that. Maybe they'll tell him that doesn't work and he needs something else. So I don't know what he's mm -hmm. thinking about right now. Oh, but if you say, okay, yeah, let, let me just sure. pipe in uh, also. Uh, so the the one thing we didn't mean mm -hmm. uh, is an accidental war, yeah. you know, or misunderstanding, miscalculation. That's what I was worried about back in the teens, you know, after they developed the nuclear arsenal. Uh, and, you know, from my standpoint, having been in the nuclear business for many, many years, uh, is uh, you know, to have a to have a nuclear arsenal has an incredible uh, responsibility on those people, uh, both the military, but then also the political leaders. Uh, and so, I could easily see things getting out of hand. They're dealing with this new thing of having some nuclear weapons, trying to build an arsenal. So that's what I was worried about. Let's say six years ago, 
Mm -hmm. uh, for, for this article, we're beyond that. Uh, and and more, we're saying that he's made a strategic decision to go mm -hmm. to war. But then to explain uh, is, uh, you know, for my sake, I I don't know how he's going to do that. And we said that we don't know when, uh, we don't know where. I would not expect a, a nuclear attack mm -hmm. in, uh, out of the clear blue, uh, because I think they have to think that through enough. Although. You know, in the end, we do have to admit, we don't really know how, how they think. But so I wasn't expecting that. I also personally, I, I was not expecting a full-scale war. You know, that they would, like the Russia-Ukraine the Russia -Ukraine situation, you know, where Putin was amassing these 100,000-plus troops uh, on the border, you know, clearly getting ready that he's going to come in. I also, I didn't, I didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. I, I thought it would be much more... Uh, sort of some something on on the West Sea, you know, but clearly, you know, escalating to the point where we actually wind up having war, where the nuclear weapons would come in, you know, I can't quite picture that because I, I, how do they view deterrence really, mm -hmm. uh, and and how do they view their nuclear force as the what these are. A novices in the nuclear business, you know, they're military people. And so they wind up with this nuclear force. So I, I couldn't quite picture that. But I guess bottom line in the long-winded answer is I wasn't thinking about accidental, you know, misunderstanding. I was thinking uh, that uh, it is going to be war. Okay, so if that's the case, uh, then I have to wonder what really new, because... Uh, when you say they made a strategic decision to go war, I saw something fundamentally different or new than before. But uh, going back to, uh, when was it, 2008 or nine when uh, they sunk a submarine uh, in the West Sea. 2010, yeah. 2010, and also uh, shelling uh, Yenpeng Island. Now, we all know that uh, South Korea really wanted to retaliate uh, Washington really holding, you know, Seoul from escalating the war. So I think looking back, uh, without uh, U.S. urging, uh, you know, Seoul to restrain uh, from retaliation, I think they could have gotten into much uh, more serious uh, military conflict. So, so you are saying that you're not talking about, you know, war by accident, but you are more worried about you know, escalation. So. Especially now, uh, the Yun government is taking very tough uh, rhetoric, right? So that they are saying that, you know, we're not going to tolerate if North Korea attacks us. We are going to, you know, pay back, you know, much more than what we got. So that means uh, there's a danger of escalation. Okay, so then uh, one likely scenario uh, following your, uh, uh, your assessment, let's say uh, North Korea does something similar to sinking some marine. They happened like 2010. Now Seoul is going to retaliate, and then it will escalate, and then maybe Washington, you know, being occupied with the war, you know, you know, you know, you know, Europe and uh, Middle East, uh, they can really support much of uh, you know war efforts for for Seoul, so that it may escalate, leading into more serious military conflict. I mean, is, is that likely scenario that uh, you have in mind, or? Or different, or I still misunderstanding your argument. The episodes that you pointed to in 2010, mm -hmm. and other people pick the nuclear crisis in 1994 and other things. In none of those were the North Koreans prepared to go to war. Did they want a war? Mm -hmm. They wanted a crisis. They wanted tensions. They didn't want a war mm -hmm. at that point. Uh, and I was, I was in the government uh, negotiating with them for a long period of time. And then I was visiting North Korea during some of these episodes. My firm conclusion is, and I don't, I don't think it was ever uh, uh, contradicted by uh, ev other evidence, classified evidence, that they were actually prepared to go further. And most of the time, in 1994, they did not want a war, specifically. They got out of it. We were the ones who wanted a war in 1994. In, in 2010, the submarine incident was not intended um, to escalate. It was done clandestinely. 
Um, and it took us a long time to establish who did it. And by that time, the tensions went down. Um, the shelling of the island was in, uh, incredible. It was so different from anything they'd ever done before. And yet they turned away within weeks and said, well, we're not going to continue this thing. So I don't think for whatever reason, they had not made a decision that this was going to be the opening shot into a larger um, military confrontation. What's different now is they're getting ready for it, that sort of confrontation because it's a policy issue. Mm. They think that the U.S. Wants, um, will never recognize the DPRK and wants the DPRK wiped off the face of the earth. In those circumstances, I think, they, Kim Jong-un believes he, there's no choice. He's, to solve his problem, as he sees it, there's going to have to be a major military act on his part mm. to break through this problem. So, what I would add uh, to that in addition, looking back at, at the 2010 uh, episodes, uh, is that the, the, in 2010, uh, I would say there was no nuclear overhang to this conflict. Mm. Uh, because by that time, uh, you know, North Korea had done a test in 2006 and it didn't work so well. So that was with plutonium, you know, that they had extracted after the agreed framework. Uh, and so it didn't work so well. So then they had to do another test. And that's actually why they greeted, in my opinion, why they greeted Obama with a, with a rocket launch it is so that they would get condemned, uh, you know, by the United States going to, uh, to the UN Security Council. They could then turn around and say, okay, the hell with you guys. Mm. We're going to do another nuclear test. So they did their second nuclear test in 2009. So now we're talking about 2010. Uh, and by that time, they had one test that really didn't work well. They had a second test, which worked okay. So the two to seven kilotons, still on the low end, but not bad. Uh, so they did not have a nuclear arsenal uh, at that point. There was no way that the military could actually tell uh, hey, Kim Jong-il, hey, we've got you covered, you know, with nuclear weapons. So it was, for that reason, it was totally different than where we are today in addition to what Bob said. Okay, so let me shift uh, focus a little bit uh, to different uh, in area. So, as you mentioned, uh, you know, you got a lot of attention, a lot of people are still writing <laughs> about your piece. And I think one piece I found quite interesting that was published uh, the six days after your piece in the same journal, uh, 38 North by Tom Schaeffer. Uh, I mean, I, you know, we all know uh, him. So he was a German ambassador to Pyongyang. And I think toward the end, uh, he's saying that uh, this recent propaganda increase has nothing to do with a policy shift, but the timing is related to the, the, the coming U.S. presidential in, in elections. So in his view, uh, Pyongyang believes that a Republican victory, especially in the Trump, would give North Korea a second chance to further its objectives. So therefore, he believes that Pyongyang will continue to increase tensions until after the U.S. election, can then try to, you know, make some deals like, uh, you know, some sort of acceptance of the nuclear program, and then, you know, even, you know, complete withdrawal of U.S. troops uh, from the Korean Peninsula and so on. So I'm sure you read, uh, you know, his piece, and then you may have heard a similar argument like this. So what's your response? So my, my quick response, yeah. uh, Bob actually uh, knows Ambassador Schiff. Yeah, yeah. So my, my, my quick response is that, that I was as unimpressed with his article as he was with ours. <laughs> and, and so, so, yeah, so mutually respected. Right? I, I know, it is just so poorly done. So the standard line, and the only thing that uh, that surprised me, it was a non-American who wrote this piece. It could have been an American uh, because what I've actually found in my, you know, I've only had seven trips, Bob is at 30 plus, uh, is actually the, the Europeans, uh, you know, understand the North Koreans much better than mm. we do in the United States. You take the Swedish embassies, right. the British uh, ambassadors, I mean, they've got a good sense. Uh, and so here was a German ambassador 
and he was sounding more like an American newspaper person. So I was unimpressed, but Bob knows him. I don't know if how many of you have seen the film Bambi, the Walt Disney film Bambi. And there's a character in there, a rabbit, little rabbit, thumper rabbit. And uh, his mother has some advice for him. If you can't say something nice, don't say anything. <laughs> so I'll stick with that. <laughs> okay, I still say something. <laughs> so maybe I got too. I violate that. Yeah, you did. Okay, so also, you know, one uh, critique uh, I hear from uh, other people uh, is that uh, I think you have a very credible analysis of the situation. But then they are saying they're looking for them. What, what are policy uh, recommendations? You know, what are solutions? So it's one thing to uh, get attention from Washington, Seoul, and others and giving some warning. But then... What, what are your suggestions to sort of mitigate uh, the current situation or... Okay, so, so let, let me explain before uh, I give it to Bob. Um, so this was one of the places we had some differences of opinion mm. in how we would end the peace. Mm. Uh, because, you know, I spent the 17 years at Stanford, uh, and as you do at APARC, as we did down at CSAC, you always have recommendations for the government. Of course we know what to do, and we're going to tell them what to do. So I started working on the last couple of sentences. Bob said, don't do that. <laughs> we, don't, we don't do that. That's the government's job. Uh, how, however, uh, let me just add, um, this uh, article not only caught the attention of uh, many uh, Korea experts, uh, just to give you an idea, as of a few weeks ago, uh, the the 38 web uh, mm. website, 38 North, had over 100,000 views of our article. Okay. Wow. That's quite a few people. Uh, and there were more than 300 articles written about our article. Okay. So, so it, it got a lot of attention. Mm. But it also got the U.S. government's sure. attention. Okay. And so we did have discussions with people in the Biden administration. And so as 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 far as, as we went, you know, we said, look, in the end, when they said, you know, what, what, what's to be done uh, is to say, hey, look, you have to treat this really seriously. And what the government would do and what people in, in Bob's old agency, in the intel agency, you, you do what's called red cells work or red teaming. Mm -hmm. You know, red team all the potential scenarios. Uh, don't tell them what to do, but to have them take this really seriously. But that, that was my view. I don't think this situation is ripe for recommendations mm -hmm. yet. Uh, we, for sure, we have to be, the military preparations have to uh, be amped up. We definitely need to be prepared for the unexpected. That's key. Uh, don't assume that we know what they're going to do. Assume that we don't know and get ready for that. Having, having improved the shield, it seems to me, that's the point at which the political decisions, diplomatic decisions can be made, how to stabilize the situation and how to change Kim Jong-un's mind if that's possible. Uh, it may not be possible but at least you have to probe to see what you can do. Mm -hmm. And you can't use any of the old approaches. Mm. They didn't work, they're not going to work. So it has to be something that takes into account why Kim has perhaps taken this decision and what will convince him that he can, he can make a new decision without losing face mm. internally uh, and, and and move in ways that will, you know, be to his greater glory, but make it less likely that there's going to be a clash. Mm. That's our goal. That's once you have a clearer goal, then you can toy toy with possible approaches to the North Koreans. But it's got to be based on something we call strategic empathy. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand the North Korean understanding of history, if you don't look at the history, if you don't see 
how the North Koreans could reach the conclusions they've reached, then you don't have a hope of addressing the problem in a way that might have impact on uh, how they view the situation. Okay, so my final question then I'll open uh, to you guys. Um, so by next uh, January, uh, we will have either Biden too or Trump too. <laughs> so what should we expect regarding North Korea policy? Bob, shall I, um, shall I give him the answer I gave to the South Korean talk show host? Yeah, go ahead. Or do that. So, uh, Bob and I were in South Korea in November, uh, and uh, I was there. Uh, we both gave talks, but I was there uh, because uh, the South Korean Strangby Publishers has done a Korean language version of my book mm. uh, called Hinge Points. Uh, and so I gave a talk, and then uh, somebody told me that you should. Um, you should go and interview with this very popular talk show host. Uh, and uh, in a program that's called Humility is Difficult. Oh, yeah. Kim. Kim was... <laughs> and uh, so I asked some of my other South Korean colleagues, and they said, oh, yeah, he's really, he's really popular. You know, you, you should do him. He's sort of little, he's sort of left the political center, but um, <laughs> I went there to his studio, third floor, going up these wooden steps, you know, going in to this place. And, and I see this guy there. He's got a big bushy hairdo like this. Uh, and and I said, whoops, you know, what did I get into? <laughs> and so he starts interviewing me. And it turns out the guy was really well prepared. Yeah. I mean, really, we went through the book. Uh, we did it through an interpreter and, and uh you can look that up in Humility is Difficult. It turns out the program, they had some other things on, had 1,020,000 views. <laughs> so so he's, he's a popular guy. And anyway, to get to the point uh, of the answer. So near the end, and he does all, ask these all the inter interesting questions. And he says, well, Dr. Hecker, so what happens next fall? Uh, you know, the United States ha has an election. Uh, and, uh, and suppose... You know, President uh, uh, Trump is is, is reelected, uh, and as you know, he's, he's very good friends with Kim Jong Un, uh, and everything is going to turn out okay in North Korea and the Korean Peninsula. So, what do you think of that? And you know, I swallowed hard and said, uh, "What I say to that?" So, I found I said to him, "I said, uh, well, that's too big a price to pay." He laughed out loud and he says, and most of his uh, conversation was in Korean, but this he said in English. He said, you mean for America? And I said, no, for the whole world. That's too big a price to pay. So at any rate, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, and um, uh, let's all keep our, uh, our fingers crossed for best thing for the United States uh, to find its way as to how to be what it's been for all these years. Bob? Don't turn okay, he doesn't want to go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of funny because uh, last year <clears throat> I also went into uh, you know political leader from uh, opposition party, you know, Democratic Party, and they were asking whether you know Trump is going to run because of the legal issues. So I said, yeah, I'm sure he's going to can run, and then he's saying, what's the chance? I mean, who knows? But he still has a chance. And then you know what he said? I wish he got elected. So I said, why? I mean, you, you are from progressive side, right? I mean, Trump, ideologically, almost opposite. But the main reason was that then maybe Trump can go back to North Korean policy. So that, that's why I think uh, your host are very similar, I think, thinking. So uh, anyway, so we got about 30 minutes. Uh, so uh, I will open up. So please raise your hand and uh, say who you are. Then just make your question uh, briefly. So I... So you're a student, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll go with you in there. Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Liana. I'm a freshman here at Stanford studying, hopefully, international relations and human rights. And I was just curious whether you think that a North Korea war with South Korea, perhaps an invasion, could coincide with a China invasion of Taiwan, either if China decides to decide to do that after North Korea or North Korea after China 
due to the U.S.'s then split attention? And then in that case, what do you think would be, although this might be obvious, more of a priority for the U.S. and why, what the reaction might be? Bob, I'll let you answer that, because for, for myself, uh, North Korea is difficult enough. Russia, Ukraine is difficult. Uh, in Taiwan, I just wouldn't know what to do. Oh, I would... Yeah. I would assume, and this is just an assumption, that if the PRC does decide to pull the trigger on a move against Taiwan, I don't know what it would look like. They would definitely want the North Koreans on their side to keep help keep the Americans occupied. Whether or not they would want, how far they would want the North Koreans to go, I don't know. But to that extent, um, uh, things would be yoked, however loosely. If the North Koreans go first without consulting the Chinese, it could very well upset Chinese plans toward Taiwan. It would accelerate things. I mean, the last time there was a Korean War, they lost, they lost Taiwan. I mean, the, we put the fleet in there and, and they couldn't go ahead. So, um, there's obviously a connection between these things. I, how would the U.S. government react? I, I don't have any idea. No idea. Good question. My question for you is this. Assuming that what you're saying, they're preparing for war, but yet nevertheless, capabilities, and I mean intentions. So, for example, the, in between 1996 and 1999, the UN Human Rights Council estimated North, about two, uh, between half a million to two million North Koreans died due to starvation. What would be the impact of that in the uh, Korean People's Army's manpower capability to affect such a war? And don't you see also a parallel between like the 1950s when the Soviet Union was developing Khrushchev, started developing all these nuclear uh, force structures to compensate for the loss of manpower in World War II in order to build up the economy, particularly given that Kim Jong Moon has been focused on economic development. It's definitely the case that um, the North Korean army has had problems feeding itself. Uh, they've had malnourishment there. They had a lot of sickness within the army. Uh, the elite troops are okay. The bulk of the army isn't. I mean, that argues, it seems to me, for them not thinking that they're going to go across the border and take on uh, South Korean and American forces, but do something else. Let me read you something. This is from a command post exercise that Kim, Kim Jong-un was at last August. And he said, uh, war preparations should sh surely take the strategic initiative by making simultaneous super intense strikes at pivotal military command centers, military ports, operational airfields, and other important enemy military targets and core objects whose destruction may cause a series of socio-political and economic chaos. Now, you could argue, well, why would Kim make this public if they really want to do this? Why not keep it quiet? I would argue that we better pay attention to this uh, because in my mind, uh, it makes sense that this is the sort of thing they would want to do quickly to, uh, to negate the ability of the United States and the South Koreans to move against them. Um, and so he may not need his ground troops in quite the same way, although he obviously used them, but he's got this strategic force. And some of it seems to be on the front lines. And he's got so many new delivery systems that can hit strategic U.S. targets within minutes, literally, from the time a missile is launched to when it hits the main U.S. base, um, Camp Humphreys in sort of southern South Korea. It's like four minutes or five minutes. Uh, people wouldn't even have time to react to that. So uh, 
again, I have to assume that his general staff is looking at each one of these scenarios and deciding which one is going to um, most blunt the United States and South Korean counterattack and do the most damage uh, to them while, while absorbing the least amount of damage themselves. Uh, thank you very much. It was very insightful. Uh, my name is Ji Hyesung. I'm a graduate student in Stanford studying uh, East Asian stu studies. I have a couple questions first, and you mentioned earlier previously, shortly, uh, uh, North Korea might upset China if they don't share their plans when they attack South Korea or something. But as far as we know, they're like allied, North Korea is allied to the China. And uh, even though their relationship is not as strong as like 2019 or 2020, still I think China would play some part uh, in North Korea's foreign like policies. So what's your opinion on China's role and how would China react to uh, the kind of provocative uh, decision of North Korea? And secondly, I also wonder, uh, because North Korea, North Korea has been known as a master of uh, rhetoric and disguise. So uh, usually when there's any elections, uh, especially when it comes to South Korea and U.S., they've been using more stronger, stronger rhetoric, and they've executed more pr provocations. So in April, there's going to be uh, Korea's general election. In November, there's going to be U.S. presidential election. So is there any chance or pr probability that North Korea is acting like that just to impact the two elections. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. So let, let me tackle, <laughs> turn to China and, and, and your comment. Uh, of course, that's all possible uh, because the North Koreans do play every angle. I mean, what impressed me when I visited there, uh, particularly the diplomats, is how well they understood American politics. I mean, so much better than if I go to Washington yeah. and try to understand how the American politicians understand North Korea. For the most part, it's nothing. Yeah. And those guys, of course, since their existence sort of depends on that whole relationship, they were so smart uh, on, on the American politics. And of course, they must know the South Korean politics. So they, I'm sure they carefully gauge how they say things and, and, and in order to do some of those things. But what we wrote and what we concluded uh, that's why we use the term strategic. These weren't tactical things associated with any of the current elections, either in South Korea for the National Assembly or, or for the presidential uh, election. These were strategic decisions, you, you know, much uh, be, beyond that. And so uh, I, I don't think that that's the issue. Uh, in addition, uh, as, you, as you said, they are masters of, of rhetoric. And, and I keep being, I mean, Bob's the one who follows everything that they write and everything that they say, uh, and uh, he usually passes it on to me. So that's, that's how, uh, how I learn. And so uh, the, some of the stuff that they publish, you know, I just said, my God, where did they get this from? Uh, and so, yes, they, they, they're masters uh, of the rhetoric. But as Bob also points out to me, in much of this war preparations talk. That's Much of that is aimed at their domestic audience. Mm -hmm. And that's, again, that sort of feeds into my concern. Uh, he's, getting, he's getting his people prepared for war. And if you read what he writes and what he says, uh, and, and this is in media that the people uh, have access to, at least some number of, of the people. And, and that's what concerns uh, me. But Bob, and there's also the, the China the China question. part. Uh, I have scant understanding of how the Chinese think about this. It's it's something that I I certainly need to do more research on, and I'm hoping other people will also focus on this because it's obviously going to be way very heavily uh, in in how things develop. As far as, you know, the North Koreans being masters of deceit, we have a long-term methodology. I mean, this goes back 40 years that it was developed uh, in the CIA to 
understand the uh, comments and statements, official statements, Soviet Union, China, Vietnam, Eastern Europe, and later on North Korea. This is a very carefully done methodology. It is not distracted by propaganda. It's not distracted by the sorts of things that the newspapers pick up or the press agents. We're looking at it because we know these things reflect decisions in the leadership. And it's decisions that we're always trying to understand, not the propaganda. So, but if, if yeah, I may, sure. let, let me just add a China comment, um, uh, because it was important in my own thinking about this article. So I, I mentioned I was in North Korea in November. And, North South Korea. I'm sorry? South Korea. I, I'm sorry, I wasn't in North Korea for a few years. It should have been North. <laughs> uh, so I was in South Korea, and, and then Bob and I went to China. Uh, and uh, and I've been working with the Chinese for 30 years, uh, off and on, mostly in the nuclear sector. And, and so particularly the last uh, uh, 20 years, we've been comparing notes uh, on the North Korea nuclear program. Uh, and, and it was very interesting early on, you know, when uh, I had access to North Korea nuclear facilities first time in 2004, I came out of North Korea, you have to go through Beijing, uh, and I stopped to see my nuclear colleagues in, in the Chinese nuclear complex. And, and they couldn't believe some of the things. You know, they said, oh, no, 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 North Koreans aren't that advanced. Well, eventually, uh, they did buy that. But so now we hadn't seen them for four years because of pandemic and other things. So uh, we went back to China. And again, I, we discussed the nuclear situation with my Chinese colleagues uh, we we're much more on the same wavelength as to what the North Koreans can do from a nuclear standpoint. Uh, and then we had two interesting uh, events at, at this one-day workshop. One of them is the Chinese did a formal uh, review of my book. Mm. Okay, And it wasn't like Thomas Schaeffer's. Uh, they thought it was fantastic. Uh, it's because, it's German, I, I, I said, I said, how about a Chinese language version of my book? Uh, One million copies. Yeah. <laughs> so at, at any rate, uh, they they did a really good job understanding what we put in the book, uh, and, and those were the the, the technical people. Then uh, we talked to a policy person, and that policy person gave us sort of the lay of the land of what's happening now uh, in North Korea. And he still goes to North Korea. He still meets with the North Koreans. He's very well connected with the North Koreans. And lo and behold, before Bob can uh, and I can present sort of our strategic empathy study mm. of how we think the tables have turned, this guy gives his own view. Mm -hmm. And it's just like what we concluded. He, he essentially says, look, Kim Jong-un is convinced that the Americans will not let North Korea exist. Uh, and so there, there is just no use uh, anymore that what we're facing uh, is a racist attitude. Uh, and and that he actually said we're facing a racist attitude. There's no hope for us, the North Koreans, you know, with the Americans. And so... Uh, Kim Jong-un, this is a Chinese scholar telling us, saying, and uh, he has concluded the final solution will have to be military. Hmm. Okay, this is what we heard in China. And, and, you know, Bob and I were already on that wavelength. But what struck me was he was a guy from China who comes up with the same conclusions of having this great concern that, and he said after Hanoi, you know, sort of the Hanois would started all this re-examination and finally got them to conclude uh, that there's no hope. And so the final solution has to be military. Hi, my name is Celeste Park. Thanks for the excellent talk. Um, so, you know, North Korea has been supplying weapons to Russia for the Ukrainian war. Um, and also you mentioned that North Korea would like to focus on the economic development of the country. So my question is, do you think it is possible to prepare war at the same time while they are supplying ammunition to Russia and focus on their economic development? 
try that first. It, it does look as if Kim has pulled back from the reform effort that he made from 2012 through, uh, let's say, 2020. He had um, many reforms in play. Enterprise, agriculture, trade, um, tourism. Uh, and they were very forward-leaning. He's pulled back from that now. At one point, and it, this may have been in, uh, as early as 2022, maybe 2021, he said, and you got to remember, one of the reasons for the long-term policy engaging the U.S. was to get an external environment so that they could focus on the economy. Okay, at, at this one point, whenever it was, 21, 22, Kim said, yes, we do need to develop our economy, but we cannot sacrifice our sovereignty one inch in order to reach that goal. That was a big uh, signal, it seemed to me. And so this effort to engage the outside and get a better environment has now been pushed aside, which means the economy is now doesn't have the um, uh, doesn't have the same imp relative importance uh, that it had. If that comes back, I'd be willing to say, okay, he's backing away from the war stuff. But at this point, I don't see that. So um, that's an in important indicator, I think. Keep your eye on. If I, it's just a, a final comment uh, related to that, because it's a very, very good question. So uh, when we did our strategic empathy study uh, of how uh, Kim Jong-un was changing things a after Hanoi, uh, we came to that conclusion uh, that he's abandoned the 30-year effort and he's going to link back up with China and Russia. And then at least from my perspective, I think that's what he tried to do. And my own view is... He didn't get very far with China. Uh, and so certainly, if, if I were Kim and I were looking for economic you know, help, assistance, development, I sure wouldn't go to Russia, for heaven's sakes. I mean, that's not the place that's going to fix his economy. you gotta, you got to go work with China. It appears, from everything we've seen, the Chinese were not very interested in this new relationship. You know, they did very, very little. On the other hand, they really hit the mark with the Russians. Uh, and that's where, you know, the artillery exchanges uh, or uh, shipment in the direction of Russia uh, and so forth, you know, appear to be very, very important. And people indeed have told us, look, if, if he's getting rid of all those artillery shells to Russia, why would he be preparing for war, you know, if he's doing that? He's giving the Russians the old stuff, uh, you know, and actually he's giving them some good new missiles like the KM-23s, maybe the 24s. And, and that's great stuff because he's getting target practice. You know, Kim's getting target practice over in the Ukraine. Otherwise, I mean, North Koreans haven't attacked anybody with missiles <laughs> for a long time, a century ever. Uh, so uh, that's uh, that's that doesn't have much to do with whether he's making the strategic decision to go to war the, the way that we have indicated. What I've added in that relationship, however. Uh, as we saw Kim uh, up, uh, uh, you know, uh, in in uh, northeast uh, uh, Russia, uh, and what we saw there really did worry me. You know, in his summit with Putin uh, in September and the follow-up since then, uh, because if I was sitting there as a North Korean nuclear guy, and I would say, "Hey, what kind of help could we get uh, from?" Uh, the um, uh, the Russians, there's a lot. Uh, and a lot of the help that would be uh, of greatest concern uh, are things that you could never track. Uh, and so, uh, to me, that, that was a great concern. And I still, I don't know what's being exchanged. Uh, I just hope that Putin does not reach into the nuclear um, capabilities and turn those some of those over to North Korea. But Back to you. Yeah, uh, my name is Sharad Lin uh, with Human Agenda. And um, um, 
So, so what you're suggesting, it, uh, is, as I understand it, is that is that basically Kim and the and the North Korean leadership have made a a strategic decision to to adjust course and and prepare for war, disengage from from, from I mean, not engage, attempt to engage with the U.S. And this is this is fundamentally different from uh, what I heard from you in, in previous presentations, which I, I have used some of your analysis in, in my talks, uh, where you showed you know direct evidence that, that North Korea was, you know, its its policy, its its the, the changes, the shifts in its policy, are are in fact you know were, were tactical shifts in response to to conditions on the outside. In other words, the U.S. posture, the the situation in South Korea, and so forth. And and so this, we're talking about a transition from 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 tactical shifts to a strategic shift, and of course the strategic shift suggests that it's more difficult for them to to change course. That there's a fundamental decision here. But if if I look back at at the the negotiations between Trump and and Kim in Hanoi, and the and the events that led up to it, um, you know there there was there was at least hope. There was, there was another factor, not only Trump, but there was also um, uh, uh, Moon Jae-in was was uh, president of South Korea. He was open to a process of, of reunification and, and certainly negotiation. So Moon Jae-in is no longer in power. Trump isn't in, isn't in power. But more importantly, the, the, the Hanoi summit um, did not even consider you know, some of the, at least based on the, on the media reports, did not even consider some of the, the fundamental points that, that, that North Korea would like to, to get out of it. One is uh, a, a drastic reduction, if not elimination of the sanctions, removal of U.S. troops from the, from the Korean peninsula, uh, and, and uh, you know, just, and, and also diplomatic recognition. And so... The hope that led up to Hanoi is now dashed, and and therefore there's a, there's a strategic rethinking, and I'm just wondering, you know, what's your what's your response to that? No, I guess from my point, uh, you just said it correctly. <laughs> uh, so the, the reason, you know, in the past, uh, in my presentations that I've given, that I was much more hopeful. Uh, I've always said, you know, in the end, whatever may have happened now that got the people excited and upset, uh, that in the end, the North Koreans were really looking towards normalization. And as long as that was a goal, there was hope. And then I even presented, I don't know if you were here, uh, give up, we did it uh, in 2018, uh, just before the Singapore summit over in the Oxenburg conference room, I showed a color-coded chart. Uh, as to what the recommendation would be for halt, roll back, and eventually eliminate the North Korean nuclear program. And I said it would take some 10 years uh, or perhaps more to do that. And so we, we actually uh, had hope at, at that time. And if the American government, uh, and at that time, you know, Moon Jae-in was there, and so on the South Korean side, you had some hope of, of that gaining traction if it could gain traction in the United States, uh, we could possibly get on the road in that direction. They weren't just going to give up the nuclear weapons uh, right away. Uh, so, but then, you know, unfortunately, what happened w was Hanoi. Uh, and again, in, in the book, the chapter on Hanoi, uh, I highly recommend that you read it because I try to explain the many different nuances that, that would happen. And so two main things. One is, I think Kim Jong-un um, made a major mistake going into Hanoi, but not allowing his negotiators to really work these issues over with Steve Began and the American negotiators before the summit. It seems to me he sort of depended on his own persona and his relationship with Trump to be able to work through that. By that time, John Bolton was back in the U.S. government, and he made sure that Trump wouldn't get anywhere close to an agreement. Uh, and, in fact, Trump was, you know, sidelined by his trouble starting with Michael Cohen and others. And so, to me, at the Hanoi summit, they left these huge things on the table. 
which could have taken us in the right direction. I had some hope. And now our strategic empathy study uh, and so forth, we look at that and we say, unfortunately, right now, uh, we've lost all of that hope. Uh, and um, it's difficult to see how we're going to get back on track. Uh, and certainly just doing things uh, in the ordinary way of saying we're willing to meet with them any place, anywhere, isn't going to get it. It's going to take some major uh, initiative on our part or something happens, you know, in the Korean Peninsula and they might rethink it. So I, I never give up hope altogether, but right now it's at a minimum. Okay, so Bob, you have final words. We shouldn't be surprised if at some point there's either acceptance by the North Koreans of an American proposal to meet or the North Koreans themselves uh, make an initiative. Uh, to me. The key, uh, the fact that we're sitting down and talking means zero in one sense. It's what we're going to be talking about. And that's what has changed. It used to be, and I remember this because I was in literally hundreds of hours of negotiations with the North Koreans. What they wanted at the end of the day was to make sure they were getting more and more engagement with the Americans long-lasting engagement. Since that's over, and they're not going to be interested in talking about that, we don't know what they're going to be bringing to the table. And, and um, it's very likely if we have unrealistic expectations, the talks are going to end very quickly, and it will reinforce the idea that you can't talk to the North Koreans. It's, it's worthless. Uh, whether or not they have something serious to discuss, um, at that point, it will be, their negotiators will have a very different set of instructions when they sit down, something that we have not faced with the North Koreans before. And so it's going to be, our negotiators are going to need a, a period to learn. They're going to have to be listening. And they're going to have to learn what it is that the North Koreans have in mind. And um, at this point, they've given us no clues. Yeah, so another major uh, concern with North Korea is uh, nuclear proliferation. So we're going to address that topic uh, on May 8th. Uh, we're going to have one scholar, one former CIA analyst. So we're going to talk about that on May 8th. So hopefully you can join us again. But uh, it has been a great uh, presentation and conversation and a little bit of debate. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much for coming back uh, to us and also uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you.